Hi guys, hello, hello. Uh, I'm giggling to myself because I, <laughs> I have a YouTube channel which I have nothing on and I just realized that I was going live from that channel <laughs> for a while and wondering why weren't we having any viewers? So uh, that was a blast. That was just a lot of fun. So I'm just gonna wait here for some viewers to show up and I hope that people are getting notifications. <sighs> there we go, hi guys. Um, I really have to wonder how many people, how bad is it that we're not, uh, people are not getting notifications. I'm getting so many messages from people all the time uh, saying that hiya, they are not getting notifications about our videos being up, about our lives being up, or they're getting a notification for the live at the end of the lives. Uh, so, man, we are being censored. And I found it very interesting as well that um, lately I've had interference with my lives where they're being cut off. Uh, no, I'm married. And that's not Jordan's ring. <laughs> but anyways... So that was, I'm answering a question there. I'm not talking to myself. So anyways, yeah, I'm glad that some people are here and uh, at least we can still reach some people whether we're being censored or not. <sighs> oh, and that I will be talking about net neutrality today, um, speaking of being censored. So uh, first of all, I just want to say again, thank you so much for putting Jordan out into the field with your subscriptions to his Patreon. He has been in Virginia. He was able to um, bring you the stories uh, of the voices of the people who were doing the pre uh, tree protest up there, protesting the pipeline. If you haven't seen those, please check them out. Uh, I particularly, I mean, I love all of it, but um, there is one called Jordan's Rants, and it's not a rant at all. It is the truth. Check that out, and that's just how I feel. Uh, and the, the interview with the mother and the daughter who are up in the trees, really, it's incredible what these oil companies are doing to the citizens and how far they will go to, to take their land and put these, um, these pipelines in. Uh, and I will be talking about that as well today. So Jordan is actually right now in a, uh, he's, he could be going live at any time, at which point I'll shut this off and pick it up later, but he will be interviewing a pastor in Amelia, Virginia soon, and then going to Buckingham, Virginia to interview people uh, about a compressor station that's being put into their town. And I know about compressor stations because I fought that. Oh, sorry, Jordan. Okay. Uh, I've fought a, a, a natural gas pipeline in New York with a compressor station, and um, they bring a lot of sickness to people who live in the area just by the fumes that they're putting out. We're not even talking about gas leaks. Uh, anyway, so he'll be coming live uh, and doing interviews in Buckingham, Virginia, uh, with the citizens in that town who are trying to fight this compressor station. Uh, so yeah, thank you for your support of his Patreon and, um, he just wants to get more people out in the field like he is right now. So, uh, every subscription is much appreciated and, um, $1, $5, $10, whatever per month, it helps. It all helps. And that's why he's out there right now. I miss, I'm sorry. I'm horrible at spelling, guys. I have to admit that right now. So I wanted to mention, uh, also, check out his um, interview with Paula Jean Swearingen. I did a piece on her, I think it was last week. Uh, she did lose to Joe Manchin, but she won in so many ways. She had 45,000 votes against him. She, you know, her um, financing her, what she had to run her campaign was, you know, pennies compared to the, the amount of money he had. And she is feisty and she is fighting and she's not going anywhere. So expect to see her in upcoming elections. Check out the interview that she did with Jordan. Um, I wanted to mention of the 17, uh, of, uh, 17 out of 20 Democratic House primaries last night were won by females. So... Uh, there is a great shift happening in this country and who is running and who is winning. And um, yeah, great changes are happening. 
So I do want to talk about the benzene uh, and compressor stations and what they do um, since Jordan will be uh, interviewing the people in a, a neighborhood that's fighting those. Um, but I want to start with something that, I mean, it all boils my blood. But this was, I don't know, it's rather atrocious. <laughs> rather atrocious. So um, is there, oh my God, these are strong. I just got these glasses. They might be too strong. Is there a war against police? This is the spin that uh, certain politicians, the narrative that they're trying to push uh, <laughs> to sort of quiet the, the fact that we're asking for police accountability. So now they're coming out with there is a war on police, which there's no evidence showing that there has been any more uh, assaults uh, or deaths of police in the past whatsoever. But uh, so this was in The Guardian, The Hill, the ACLU. Uh, there is an act called the Protect and, uh, Protect and Serve Act that would make police a protected class and violence against them a hate crime. So um, from the outset, this type of legislation is completely unnecessary because it already exists. This already exists. And what they're trying to do with this is just to... Um, May set the narrative that there is a war on police. So uh, police already have laws protecting them at both the federal and state levels. These bills serve only to further the myth that there is a war against police happening, and that simply is not the case. Calling for uh, police accountability is not the same thing as waging war against police, but it is viewed as such by those who uh, uh, think that questioning police is wrong and that uh, this act would actually give them uh, complete impunity. They could do basically whatever they want. So U.S. senators introduced a bill on Tuesday that would make certain kinds of violence against law enforcement qualify as hate crimes under federal law. The Senate Protect and Serve Act would make a, it a crime to knowingly cause bodily injury to any person or attempt to do so because of the actual or perceived status of the person as a law enforcement officer, which is nearly identical to the language that accompanies hate crime laws. Under the law, injuring or attempting to injure a law enforcement officer could be punished by up to 10 years in prison. Senator Orrin Hatch, please, we please, we need to get rid of him. Lead sponsor uh, of the Senate bill said in a statement that the legislation makes clear that no criminal will be able to escape justice when he singles out and assaults those who put on a badge every day to keep us safe. Orrin Hatch, dust yourself off, clear out the cobwebs. Orrin Hatch uh, is the he is on my shit list for uh, Grand Staircase Escalante and Bears Ears, uh, pushing for that, among other things that he does in Utah. Um, he is <clears throat> he is the lowest of the low. Uh, Kanea Bennett, legislative counsel at the American Civil Liberties Union, called the Senate bill nothing short of offensive to historically persecuted and marginalized communities across this country. The Senate version was introduced by Orrin Hatch and Heidi Heitkamp. Uh, calling for police account. I'm oh, sorry. So um, they're trying to shift the narrative. The popularity of the bills followed a small number of high profile targeted, targeted killings of law enforcement. The incidents in New York, Dallas, and Baton Rouge occurred as the police killings uh, of America, especially on our black man, black men drew national focus. So there were three incidents that uh, police officers were killed on duty. Three in which they're trying to blow this up as police are under attack. There is a war against police. Three. Now, how often do we hear about unarmed people being shot by police officers. 
three. Uh, in 2014, two NYPD officers were shot in their parole car by a gunman who made very anti-police remarks on social media, including saying that he was putting wings on pigs today. In the summer of 2016, two shootings in Dallas and Baton uh, Rouge killed five and three officers respectively. In both cases, the shooters left behind material suggesting that they were spurred by animosity towards police. Um, so they're taking these small, uh, these incidences uh, and they're pushing this whole narrative that now we need stronger wars against people who try to assault police officers, um, which they already have. So uh, the Senate version makes police a protected class something that up until now was reserved for marginalized groups because crimes against them often went unacknowledged, uninvestigated, and unpunished. There are no statistics showing that police are in any more danger now than they have been previously. There are no stati statistics that show police are being attacked or otherwise harmed at higher rates right now than they were recent uh, in the past. And there is nothing to back the belief that police need even further special protection under any additional laws. So exactly what constitutes violence against a police officer? This is where it gets rather scary. I did a report two or three weeks ago about how ICE was lying to people about the stats that they were releasing on how many ICE officers were being assaulted. Um, <laughs> that was absurd. And that was obviously to push the narrative that we need a wall, that there are bad hombres, that uh, um, it's fear mongering. Uh, what they had done in that um, case was if a police officer was hit with a plastic water bottle in the head or the chest, um, that was considered an assault. And that was considered three assaults because it was the person throwing the bottle, the bottle itself, and the police officer who were being uh, counted as separate assaults. Just watch that video. Um, so they were counting things as assaults where police officers were not getting hurt at all. They were counting things as assaults. Even if a person had a stick in, uh, in their hand and did not use it on the ICE agents, they were still recording that as an assault. So in this case, what could happen? Um, I mean, these people, it, it's punishable. Assaulting a police officer would be punishable for up to 10 years in prison how often do you think that police officers are going to bend the truth, if not break the truth, to put more people in prison? And again, and again, everything we're seeing lately is just furthering mass incarceration. And it's, it's really, it's very scary. And I, I feel like this is just another piece of legislation that they're trying to put in place, number one, to... Um, take emphasis off of uh, police accountability and fear monger that police are being attacked, but also to put people in prison who do not belong there. So um, the author of the, um, the piece uh, in The Hill said, uh, if a police officer goes to grab your arm and you instinctively pull away, your nails accidentally scratch him or her as you do so, are you now guilty of a hate crime against a police officer? Are you now going to be put in jail for 10 years? Um, so how and when will these laws be enforced and against who? Uh, again, uh, Kanyea Bennett, the legislative counsel at the Washington Legislative Office at the American Civil Liberties Union said in a statement, the bill serves no purpose other than to further dangerous and divisive narratives that there is a war on police. The House creation of a new criminal statute for offenses against police is superfluous 
given the many existing federal and state laws that protect law enforcement officers already. The Senate's version is nothing short of offensive to historically persecuted and marginalized communities across this country. Federal hate crime laws were passed to correct the centuries uh, of inaction and injustice that too often was the response to violence based on immutable traits of identities, including rape, gender, uh, race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, and disability. The definition under no possible interpretation could include being a member of law enforcement. Congress should vote this down quickly and decisively. So again, uh, hate crimes were put into place for minority groups who were not uh, getting a fair investigation, who were not getting a, a fair trial, and now they're they're classifying police officers as a minority group. Um, the ACLU, along with Human Rights Watch, the Leadership Conference of Civil and Human Rights, and the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund wrote a letter to Senate asking that senators oppose the introduction and co-sponsorship of this bill, writing in part, extending hate crimes uh, protections to law enforcement officers is a profoundly inappropriate and misguided proposal for several, several reasons. First, police already have su uh, substantial protections under federal and state law, rendering the bill uh, superfluous. Second, hate crime laws are intended to extend protection to historically persecuted groups. Um, I already said that. Anyways, um, they say that uh, there is a war on police, which is not only untrue, but an unhelpful and dangerous narrative to uplift. Fourth, uh, bills similar to protect and serve have been introduced uh, to states around the country, including the Blue Lives Matters bills. Uh, they appear to be political response to the growing nationwide movement for police accountability in the face of continued killings and assaults of unarmed African Americans. Therefore, this bill is divisive and will have a negative impact on relationships between law enforcement and the communities they serve. No kidding. Um, there are already communities all across the country that are being over-policed and this kind of, of a law is going to make the situations so much worse. I was at a Black Lives Matter, uh, covering a Black Lives Matter um, press conference the other day. And I was speaking to a woman who said that she has a 12 year old son um, and she lives uh, in a minority uh, area, city, Buffalo, New York. And she told me that she tells him when he's walking to school, if he sees a police officer, to put his head down, to direct his eye line away from the police officer, because she's afraid that he's going to get in trouble with them for absolutely nothing. So her son, literally, when he sees a police officer, looks down. Uh, another woman there told me that when people in the neighborhood have an emergency, the last person they will call is a police officer. They will call their neighbors. They will call family members. They will not call police officers. That's how bad the relationship between police officers and uh, people in these neighborhoods is. And yes, they are shooting and killing people all the time in Buffalo, New York, just alone. Um, they have these illegal stops where they're stopping cars and they're they're checking checkpoints. They're checking people uh, with no reason. They are saying that they're checking for drunk drivers. And this is all day, every day, two o'clock uh, p.m., a checkpoint, five blocks down, another checkpoint. And people have been, uh, a woman was dragged out of her car and shot at one of the checkpoints. <sighs> We shouldn't have to live in a country where the people who protect us are the people who we need protection from. So um, again, the stats, what, what, why are people scared of police officers? An average, on average in the United States, a police officer takes a life of a citizen every seven hours. 
I, I cannot believe that that is necessary. One death every seven hours at the hands of police officers in the United States. In 17% of 100 largest cities in the United States, police officers killed African-American men at a higher rate than the U.S. murder rate in 2014. Uh, that was Mother Jones. In Oakland, California, the NAACP, P reported that out of 45 officer involved shootings in the city between 2004 and 2008, 37 of those shot were black, not white. One third of those shootings resulted in fatalities, although weapons were not found on 40% in 40% of the cases. Uh, that was the NAACP. 97% uh, of the cases of police brutality were tracked in 2015, did not result in any officers being involved, uh, involved being charged with a crime. No accountability whatsoever. And as I said earlier, asking for police accountability is not the same as waging a war on police officers. Very different. Uh, what was this uh, saying that was everywhere? I'm not against police officers. I'm against uh, bad police officers. That wasn't very, <laughs> that wasn't exactly as catchy as the original. 69% uh, of victims of police brutality in the United States who are African American were suspected of nonviolent crimes and were unarmed. So, um, Every day we're seeing um, more pushback against the the movement to ask for we're, we're we're asking for police accountability. We're not asking for anything um, absurd, and this is only because every single day we're we're seeing more and more unarmed people being killed by police officers. I'm doing a piece right now about the holding center in Buffalo, New York, uh, there are an incredibly large amounts uh, of deaths in the holding center itself in Buffalo, New York. Uh, some are suicides. Some are uh, people just dying, uh, having a heart attack. What is going on? These people who are supposed to serve and protect us um, are becoming something that people fear and it shouldn't be that way. And this kind of uh, act is only gonna make things worse. But I mean, what's the root of it? What is the root? Yes, the uh, mass incarceration, um, but it's, it's the politicians who are pushing this and passing it. And as you would see in my report the other day, there are so many politicians who are paid by private prisons, who receive money from private prisons, that of course, they're gonna get their way. Uh, we need to stop voting in these politicians who are being paid, being paid and in turn, just waging war against the citizens of the country. Yeah. I like my glasses, but I'm not used to wearing them now. So um, as I said, Jordan is going to be interviewing and going to a town in uh, Virginia, a community that they're fighting to stop a compressor station from being put into their town and with really good reason. So, um, like I said, we fought the National Fuel Pipeline here in New York last year and we stopped it. We went to multiple hearings and at those hearings, the most moving and just sad part of each hearing was when we would be listening to uh, people who were suffering from cancer or sicknesses or people whose loved ones or friends had died from cancer or sicknesses. Uh, and this was just from the compressor stations themselves. So we're not talking about when the pipelines explode or they leak. And this is, we're talking about nat nat natural gas. So um, 
benzene pollution from the compressor stations and there's a lot more uh, of pollutants you know other than just benzene that comes out of these compressor stations but benzene in particular causes a rare form of leukemia that is quite fatal and um I sat there and I listened to uh, a man who had lost his wife. I listened to a nurse from Roswell Park Cancer Institute in Buffalo speak about children and elderly people that were coming in who lived around the compressor station who had cancer. So um, again, our country is poisoning its people and it's all about the almighty dollar. So what is a compressor station? Uh, compressor stations are needed uh, on average every 40 to 100 miles along pipelines to repressurize natural, natural gas and keep it moving long distances. Uh, they're huge, they're absolutely huge and they're super loud, but that is the, the smallest of the problems. Compressor stations release huge amounts of, <laughs> huge amounts of toxins these toxins include benzene, toluene, sulfuric oxide, and formaldehyde. Citizens within a 1,500 uh, feet of the compressor stations will be uh, definitely affected by these toxins, and it could reach much farther than that. Uh, Curtis Nordegard, MD, uh, stated that the compressor stations release uh, and this is a doctor who works at Boston's Children's Hospital. So he has seen firsthand also the effects of these compressor stations on children. And you know, uh, our president has such a soft spot for children. Uh, and that's why he's pushing so hard for oil and gas and fossil fuels, right? No, um, it's all bullshit. It's all lies. So uh, this doctor, Curtis Norgard of the Boston's Children's Hospital, Hospital says that the compressor stations release particulate matter that causes asthma, heart attacks, diabetes, which he sees every day uh, from people living around that area, benzene, which causes leukemia, bone marrow suppression, formaldehyde, which causes asthma and several types of cancer, nitrogen oxide, which produces hazardous ground ozone, and asthma triggers associated with respiratory tract irritation and infection. Uh, benzene levels have been measured near compression stations that are far exceeding cancer-causing thresholds, and uh, the Department of Health again and again in every single town that I've looked into knows about this. And it, they do nothing about it. The Department of Health, a lot of the um, pollution laws are waived uh, when it comes to these compressor, compress, compressor stations. Question mark. Um, formaldehyde levels can exceed cancer causing thresholds up to at least half a mile away from compressor stations. So here is a resident who lived uh, by the compressor station in Texas, and you're gonna hear more of this live. Actually, no wait, Jordan's interviewing people who are fighting the compressor stations, so they haven't um, been affected by it yet, so that's great. But uh, this is a, a, someone who has been affected by it, Charles E. Morgan in Texas. I have suffered brain damage, heart damage, ruptured eardrum twice, and now have a permanent hole in my eardrum and suffer from restless leg syndrome. I lived in my home 21 years in near perfect health before the compressor station came. It is 0.9 miles from our home. Our neighbors are suffering also including ruptured eardrums, vertigo, restless leg syndrome, syndrome incontinence in young women, Men can become sterile also and suffer sexual dysfunction. All of these symptoms are of vibroacoustic disease caused by the compressor station, the noise coming from the compressor station. This is just because of the incredible um, noise and, and that power, the vibration that the compressor stations put out. Uh, we have several people who who have died recently from brain aneurysms and heart attacks, all of them had LFN, uh, 
at their homes. I'm sorry, I'm listening to my dog struggle upstairs and wondering what's going on. Uh, so the, that's the, the compressor stations near their homes. To have a compressor station within 20 feet of a home is absolutely absurd. It will be uninhabitable. Our home here is uh, within 500 feet of the compressor station near me and on the opposite side has sold four times and now is owned again by the compressor station owner. It is uninhabitable. A typical um, compressor station releases 46.2 tons of nitrous oxide per year. Uh, which is an anesthetic for dental surgeries. Nitrous oxide can cause numbness, mental impairment. It has a, a sticky sweet smell. And that is the one thing that I heard time and time again when I was at the, the hearings is that you could smell it. That everyone who came up says you can smell that sweet smell coming from the compressor station. So um, these things are putting out these toxins on a regular basis to the point where uh, a lot of residents say they can taste it. And sometimes if it gets too intense, they have to bring their children in. Their children are outside playing on certain days. They'll say it's too strong. They will bring their children in. And the sad thing is how safe do you think the kids are in their houses as compared to being on their front lawn? It's in the air. And no one's going to move in. So these people can't sell their houses because no one's going to buy it then. When the compressor station is built there, they're stuck there. No one will buy that property. They have nowhere to go. And many of these people now no longer have health care. So our government is, um, yeah, doing a great job. Uh, nitrous oxide and volatile organic compounds interact to produce ground level ozone. Ozone inhibits crop growth up to 30%. So a lot of these people that uh, are farmers who live near these um, compressor stations, now their crops aren't growing. And going back to how he said a lot of men are um, not fertile, um, their, their bulls are not fertile either so their their cows are not fertile so they're having their livelihood taken away from them as well as having their life taken away from them uh, compressor station emits radon 222 this radioactive gas precipitates out as a radioactive polonium and lead in the air during blowdowns these toxins deposit in surrounding areas um so compressor stations are significant contributors to global warming during ventings that they call blowdowns. Large quantities of methane are released into the atmosphere. So not only is this gas coming through on a regular basis, but then they have this venting um, quite often called blowdowns where they're literally blowing out the toxins from the compressor stations. So now we can add global warming into the mix because they're they're putting out incredible amounts of methane. And it's so hard to hear the lies and, and then hear people repeat them that natural gas is green. That natural gas is a green form of energy. I feel like we're at a point, ugh, we must have been at this point uh, forever, but that anyone can say anything now and people will believe it. You can say anything now and people will believe it. You know what? You have uh, arsenic in your soil. It's actually good for you. Arsenic is green and people will believe it. I don't understand. So, but people won't believe liberals uh, or snowflakes um, who will tell you, hey, people are getting sick. People are dying. People have cancer. People have lead poisoning. Because I get the, the feedback all the time from people dismissing me as a crazy liberal. And I think that's just 
great because I think that our, our government sets it up that way by having Republicans and Democrats, they're already pitting us against each other so that anytime we try to share information with our neighbors who might have a different political uh, party affiliation than us, they immediately shut us down. You know, my neighbor is a Republican and I'm trying to tell her, you know, this pipeline is bad for our community. And right away, just because I'm a Democrat, she just has her idea of what I stand for and she's ready with her fighting words that she's already heard from Republican politicians and propaganda. So we're fighting so many things, uh, but make no mistake, the people who are winning are the huge corporations um, and the politicians. They pit us against each other so that they can have their way. And uh, they do, but let me mention uh, real quick, it was in California, was the first state to pass the law that any new houses being built need to be built with solar panels, right? So um, there is progress, there is progress, and we just have to keep fighting to continue the progress. So um, yes, compressor stations leak methane via valves and gaskets that are weakened and leak from corrosion and thermal stress. A recent study by Cornell University scientist Bob Howard and Anthony Ingerafia estimates leaks. They found that anywhere between 3.6% to 7.9% of unburned methane leaks out of gas wellheads and along pipeline infrastructures before reaching end users. So now we're talking about not only the compressor stations, but this gas is leaking out of the pipelines all the way down to wherever it's going on a regular basis. So if you're anywhere along that pipeline, you're going to feel uh, the effects of it. I mean, why do you think the United States is, is such a sick, sick country? MS, cancer, the rates here are so high. What was it in uh, China or one of the, the countries? Uh, they barely have breast cancer at all. So um, compressor stations, I do have the amount of uh, the mileage of these pipe pipelines. But anyways, compressor stations, since 2011, there have been uh, uh, explosions and fires at over 11 compressor stations. And these are only the ones that were recorded because like I said, the Department of Health turns a blind eye to everything. And so do a lot of other people. These were the ones that were large enough not to be ignored. Uh, compressor stations are fully automated. So when something goes wrong, there's not someone there who can take care of it right away. And the local fire department does not have the means to take care of it. So they have to call in a special crew, which can sometimes take hours to get there. So, um, you know, if you live around that area and there's a, a fire at the compressor station, get in your car and leave. And that is a very sad thing. Um, Department of Health, yes, has been silent on the dangers posed by fracked gas and compressor stations. So the lies, I looked on uh, any natural gas pipeline website, any natural gas company website, if you look on them, it's just straight up lies. I got this um, from Energy Information Administration Office of Oil and Gas Natural Gas Division. This is what their website said. Natural gas pipelines, compressor stations like this one on the Trailblazer pipeline uh, in northeastern Colorado offer strong opportunities for clean and renewable energy from waste heat recovery. Yes, clean and renewable energy. 3,900 compressor stations. Uh, there are... Um, Roughly, and this was last year, so it must be more now, 3,900 compressor stations across North America, and that number is growing. Between 1986 and 2016, 
just under 9,000 significant pipeline-related incidents have taken place nationwide, according to the data from Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. And that is not counted in the total, uh, the thousands of less significant pipeline-related malfunctions. These were just, again, the big ones, big enough that they had to uh, take notice of it, big enough that people knew about it and they couldn't just sweep it under the rug. Uh, these accidents have resulted in 548 deaths, 257 injuries, and over $8.5 million in financial damages. Uh, there are around 2.6 million miles of pipelines of varying sizes in the United States, quietly carrying everything from hazardous liquids like crude oil to refined products like jet fuel and natural gas. Carl Weimer, executive director of Pipeline Safety Trust said, there isn't one single cause of any of these pipelines that you can point at and say, that's what the problem is. So it's just, the problem itself is the pipeline. The problem itself is the pipeline. Uh, from 1994 to 2013, the U.S. has had uh, 745 serious incidents with gas distribution, causing 278 fatalities and 1,059 injuries with, uh, wow, yeah, close to a million dollars in property damage. In 1994 through 2013, there was an additional 110 serious incidents with gas transmission, resulting in 41 fatalities and 195 injuries. Uh, from 1994 through 2013, there were an additional 941 serious incidents with gas, uh, all system types, resulting in 363 uh, fatalities and thir uh, 1,392 injuries. So, when there is a problem, typically you would think that a government should try to fix that problem or end that problem, especially when it's resulting in the death of citizens. But that doesn't seem to be the case with fossil fuels. Um, you know, your head spins thinking about it. And it's, it's sad because it's just because these politicians are paid off by fossil fuel industry. They're bought and sold to the highest bidder and they have so many people controlling them that it leaves the American citizens uh, with what? We're sick, uh, we're poor, we're stressed and the politicians continue to exasperate that. But uh, there's hope, obviously, like I said there are so many new people coming up in the political scene who actually care about the people and a lot of activists who have turned uh, into politics because that's how much they know that we can't like make progress in this country with the politicians that we have right now. So pardon me, I'm about to drink something that is going to poison me. Yes, I am. This is this is not good for me. This is not good for me. We have the soda stream where you can carbonate water and flavor it because I have an addiction and it's bubbly drinks besides green tea. But uh, there was none left and this was in the fridge. <laughs> I know how bad it is for me. Trust me. Uh, okay. Lastly... Yeah, it is. It is. I don't want to promote it. So lastly, net neutrality. Net neutrality is back on the scene. And thank God, because um, I have to wonder, is this just because elections are coming up that, that the Democrats are just trying so hard to please their constituents when oftentimes it seems like they don't give a two shits? So, um... The repeal of net neutrality rules will take effect in June. 
uh, June 11th to be exact, and that is six months after the Federal Communications Commission's voted to eliminate uh, the rules that prohibited internet service providers from blocking and throttling internet traffic. So on Capitol Hill on Wednesday, 15 Democrat senators uh, called to protect net neutrality. Now, you probably already know this, but I do want to talk about real quick at the end as well, the kind of money that these huge corporations paid politicians that they're controlling, like Comcast and Verizon, uh, the amount of money that they gave to politicians. No wonder they are... Uh, repealed net neutrality. Again, bought and sold. But let's talk real quick about the Democrats uh, trying to be the good guys and listening to their constituents. Senate Democrats believe net neutrality is a political winner as they try to reinstate regulations. They believe it's a political winner, probably because what was it like? What was the percentage of, of Americans who voted uh, to keep net neutrality, uh, the majority. Um, Chuck Schumer says, are they protecting average consumers and middle-class families, or are they protecting the big corporate special interests? Democrats called enough, uh, collected enough signatures on a petition that forced a Senate vote to employ the Congressional Review Act. So, which if it is passed, would be the first step towards overturning the FCC's uh, action and reinstating the rules that were designated uh, to ensure the uninhibited flow of data online. So this uh, Congressional Review Act is a 1996 act that allows Congress to overturn federal agency rule by simply by a simple majority vote in the chamber. So signatures from 30 senators require the Senate to hold a vote that cannot be filibustered or blocked by any majority leader. The Senate vote is expected next week and must be held by June 9, uh, 12th due to a time limit triggered by the publication of the FCC's new rule in the federal registration. So if John McCain continues to be absent because of his cancer treatment, Democrats have already secured the 50 votes needed to pass the measure with the public support of Senator Susan Collins, who is a Republican from Maine. Uh, but there are the big companies like Facebook and Google and Amazon are pushing to secure more votes from Republicans, not really comfortable with uh, it hinging on whether John McCain is going to be well enough or not. So uh, other Republicans and conservative activists who oppose net neutrality regulations as heavy handed government oversight have branded the effort as a political stunt, a political stunt. It's so good that they're listening to the constituents because the majority of us Americans said we want net neutrality, but somehow this is a political stunt listening to the citizens of uh, the country about what they want. Republicans against net neutrality said Democrats might be able to sneak the reinstatement measures through the Senate because of McCain's absence, but it will never pass the Republican-controlled House and get signed by Trump. Instead of crafting, instead of crafting forward-looking solutions that protect internet users and promote innovation, Congress will spend the upcoming days on more political theater. Senator John Thune wrote in an opinion article on CN CNBC's website Wednesday. I love how they frame this shit. Um, that they want to protect internet users. That's why they got rid of net neutrality, because they want to protect internet users. Oh, is that why? Well, they aren't they just the heroes? <laughs> These people are so dirty. I don't know how they live with themselves. But again, the sad part is, the not the majority, but all these uh, Republicans believe this shit. Like, we're all here on the same planet hearing the same stuff. If people would just really pay attention to the facts and what's happening, they could see very clearly, um, in this case, that net neutrality... Uh, was 
put in place for the protection of us and not the opposite that they're trying to protect us by getting rid of it. Oh, I hate these people. So who is bought by these huge um, net neutrality opponents? Who, what politicians are bought off? Uh, Comcast. So Comcast obviously does not want net neutrality. Comcast is one of Washington's most powerful influence wielders. Um, at least 31 members of Congress sh uh, owned, shares, owned shares in Comcast in 2015. 31 members of Congress owned shares in Comcast. Uh, in 2016, the 2016 cycle, 360 House members out of 435 and 52 senators were recipient, recipients of campaign donations from either Comcast corporate PAC or employees of the country uh, of the company. Comcast donors gave a total of $3.9 million to congressional candidates in 2016. we do with that 3.9 million dollars instead of buying off our politicians wouldn't it be great if they did something real for the people imagine how the stock in comcast would go up if comcast spent 3.9 million dollars in fixing the water crisis in flint michigan or um helping the teachers helping students um it just really but pay off the politicians um in the 2016 cycle house members received an average of uh, 6345 in campaign donations senate members received 12000 uh, 618 on average. Senate Republicans received about $6,000 more on average than Democrats. Let me just ask the question now. Um, is it because Democrats are, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They have uh, integrity and they're not accepting these um, campaign donations from Comcast? Is it that if they were offered this money from Comcast, would they take it? Or is it just that they're just not being offered it? Like, like that makes it seem like the Democrats are great. And I, I, I'm not saying Republicans are great, but that statement alone, Senate Republicans receive about 6,000 more on average than Democrats. I, I don't think it's because Democrats would say no to the money, some of them. I think it's just maybe because they weren't offered it because uh, it, it's a, it doesn't matter, Republican or Democrat. We know that politicians, so many of them, are bought and sold. So uh, in the House, members of both parties received similar amounts. There you go. So Verizon. Uh, in which uh, the FCC chair, Ajit Pai, worked for Verizon uh, for two years. So in 2015, at least 50 members of Congress own stock in Verizon, making it the 10th most popular investment for lawmakers. In the 2016 cycle, Verizon gave more than $2.3 million to congressional candidates like Comcast, the company's PAC and employees favored Republicans with their donations. 325 members of the House and 67 in the Senate took campaign cash from Verizon donors, with House members averaging 4,400 apiece and senators about 6,700 apiece. In 2016, Verizon spent $10.1 million in lobbying. Mm. AT&T, 47 members of Congress owned shares in AT&T in 2015. AT&T PACs and employees gave more than $3.7 million to congressional candidates in 2016 
AT&T donors favored Republicans and contributed to a 381 members of the House and about 88 uh, percent, that's about 88 percent of the members of the House received campaign contributions from AT&T. And 91 senators. The average donation to the House recipi uh, recipient was 6,653, and for the Senate, the figure was 6,297. AT&T was the ninth biggest spender on lobbying in 2016, roughly $16.4 million they spent on lobbying and had 101 federal lobbyists. Uh, one more. National Cable and Telecommunications Association, the NCTA, is a major trade group uh, representing companies like Comcast, Verizon, and AT&T, and consequently is uh, another powerful force in Washington because they pay very well. The association gave congressional candidates more than $1.7 million in 2016. In 2016, the NCTA ranked number 16 on the list of biggest spending on lobbying with roughly $13.4 million. The association's uh, own lobbying force is 86 people strong. Uh, and three of the, their lobbyists are former members of Congress, which is the same for some of the other companies that their lobbyists are former members of Congress. So it's all a big web of corruption. So what's the takeaway from this? It's always the same. Get money out of politics, get money out of politics, get money out of politics. Uh, and while we're at it, let's throw in a side of go green. And when I say go green, I don't mean natural gas or fracking at all. Uh, go green. And uh, wow. So that's that for the day. Uh, oh, sometimes it's sad uh, because the news seems it it you seem down right after you you read about what's happening in the country. I'm going to have to literally look very hard for good news because uh, yes, I think I need that to offset all this. But uh, again, we do have good news. Um, yesterday's elections, even though uh, Paula Jean Swearingen did not win, uh, we have a lot of really great winners in that. And uh, again, check out Jordan's interview with Paula Jean Swearingen. Uh, he will be going live, I, I believe maybe sometime today, uh, with people from, where is it, Amelia, no, Buckingham, Virginia, uh, where they're fighting this compressor station. And uh, again, thank you so much for contributing to his Patreon because it is your contributions that put him out uh, in the field where he can get these stories to you. And he looks forward to a lot more of that, uh, both himself in the field and other journalists. Uh, but as he's explained so many times, uh, he's starting from scratch with this, and he is um, depending on subscriptions from uh, from you, from people, to grow his channel status quo, to keep him and put him out on the field. So um, thank you very much for that. So keep an eye out for him. He should be going live soon, and check out his report with Paula Jean Swearingen if you haven't seen it yet. And uh, thanks for joining us today. I will see you soon.